Hello. <gülüyor> Welcome to our Müthiş Türkler uh, ve dostları. Today we have Alex Demir. And um, Alex is actually, his parents are Turkish, right? Yes. Where are they from? Both of my parents were born in Istanbul. Okay. Yeah, and I was born in New York. When did they come here? In the mid 60s. Mid 60s. Mid 60s. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So a long time ago. Okay. Long time ago, yeah. Yes. Yeah. And uh, they moved to New York City then. They originally moved to the Bronx, New oh. York. Yeah. And that's where I was born, and that's where I grew up and went to school, and had my formative years. Yes. Um, and uh, and now I'm out here. So you you are an American, but probably do you do you consider yourself Turkish American? I'm or? a Turkish American. Yeah, sure. I I know that's where my even my sister was born in Turkey. So I'm the only oh. person in my family. Okay. Not born there. I'm first generation American. Yes. Um, but yeah, I I realize my roots, my family's roots are from Turkey, and. I, I understand Turkish rather well. Yani an, anlayabiliyorum ama o kadar iyi konuşamıyorum. Onun için İngilizce konuşuyorum. Daha iyi benim için. Daha, ko- daha kolay geliyor. Yes, yes. But the Kusura is... bakma. <gülüyor> Estağfurullah efendim. Uh, I think you sound great actually. You, you sound better than you think. Sometimes. Basit basit şeyler. You know, I could talk uh, about simple things. <gülüyor> but if you want to really get into a deep conversation, yeah. Türkçe konuşamam. Okay. So you performed in front of these people and your teacher thought you had something special. Yeah, yeah. And that was the first time I ever heard anything like that. Hmm. The first time I ever heard that I had talent at something uh, that was legal. <laughs> um, we, should like, we should go there. Oh, uh, boy. Oh, come on. Come on, come on, come on. Well, you know. Tell me. What no, kind of a kid were you? I, I was a troubled kid. Okay. Yeah, I was troubled. My father passed away when I was young. Yes. So that um, I had no male role model. Mm-hmm. And I was young. I was 15, 14, 15 years old. So I couldn't, I didn't know how to make sense of this. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was just, I turned into a, a, like a wild animal. Yeah. And unfortunately, you know, I put my poor mother through a lot. And. Um, yeah, there's no other family. There are no uncles, no. nobody. They're all in there. Turkey. Yeah, you're like pretty much all by yourself here yeah. with a mother who is trying to make a living, I Exactly. Guess. It must be very tough on everybody, though. It was, especially on my mother. Okay. I, I made life very hard for her, and I feel terrible about that. Um, I just had no direction, and I had, uh, like I said, no strong male authority figure yeah. in my life. So I went crazy. I just turned into a, a you know, a maniac. Probably it would be easier for her to deal with it in Turkey because you know what can go wrong in your child's life in your own country. So you might be able to actually find ways. But like now I am I am raising a kid here. Yeah. And I'm not sure what kind of problems could happen. So I don't I'm I don't have the tools, but thankfully my husband is American, yeah. so he's more aware of it. It might probably for a Turkish woman to deal with that was very hard. Yeah, she's in a new foreign culture. Yes. And she has this son who she has no clue. She has yeah. she had no idea how to control me. It, <laughs> it, it was just oh, when I think about what I put my mother through. Oh. Yeah, it's really. It, it, but then you found acting. Yeah, did I it, found did acting. Did it change? Did Did it get rid of your problems? Yeah. Yeah. It. I finally had an outlet. Yes. An outlet that wasn't going to get me arrested. An <laughs> yes. outlet that wasn't going to put me in the hospital. And you could act a criminal. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> right? And now, you know, uh, ironically, or not so ironically, I get cast in many roles where I'm a criminal. I'm a gangster. I'm a hitman. I, uh, I'm someone who's got... Uh, violence on his mind. I, I play those roles a lot. Do you, do you take anything from your uh, from your real life events? Like, are you one of those method actors, or are you creating your characters, or is there anything that belongs to you in those characters? Well, I grew up in an area where I was surrounded by those kinds of people. 
not, I didn't grow up in an area where I was surrounded by um, farmers, for yes. example. So, of course, it's much easier for me to play a inner city or an ethnic anything, whether tough you be guy, a gangster right? or a tough guy or even you know, an, an, an ethnic blue-collar mm. you know, construction worker or something. That's easier for me to play than, for example, a cowboy yes. or a farmer or a uh, you know, nuclear physicist or something. Um, I'd like to branch out and explore roles like that. However, I understand it's, it's a business and there are people who those roles come more naturally to than me. I would have to do a lot of research and meet with people, whereas someone else would probably have, it would just come easily. Whereas for the roles I play, I've done my research. I lived that life. I grew up yeah. in the middle of it. So it comes very, very easily to me. Uh, I guess also the director wants to work into the cliche and here's your person. You don't even have to explain it. Here, yeah. Here's the look. Yeah. But yeah. it might get tiring after a while or even annoying. <laughs> Well, if that was all I did, it was get annoying. But luckily, I do other roles as well, where I'm not just, okay. you know, I do other roles as well. It's just I seem to be cast a lot in those tough guy roles. Yes. Because they think I look like that, yeah. the way I sound, and it comes easily to me, just because of where I grew up. Yeah. That's so all. we skipped ahead. So you, you did your work as a student actor with this woman, and she, was, she had something to tell you. Yeah. And luckily, it wasn't something negative. Yeah. And it changed your life. And it then, did. what happened? It changed my life. So she gave me, what she said to me kind of lit a fire under me. And um, like I said, it was the first time I had ever heard that I'm good at something that's, yeah. that's not going to get me in trouble. And um, it, I, I, uh, I started studying more hmm. with her class, other classes. And then maybe a year or two later, I finally built up enough courage to start auditioning for plays, off-Broadway plays. That was a huge step for me because you know, nobody in my neighborhood, nobody in my family, nobody in my immediate or extended family had anything to do with acting. Yes. Had, had any clue, acting, business, plays, theater, movies. It was like you might as well say, okay, you're gonna, you want to go to go to Mars? And yeah. You want to be same thing, same thing. It's lonely. It, it was very lonely. I had, but, but thank God I was going to classes. I was going to acting classes, so I was surrounding myself with artistic people in New York, in Manhattan. And then they exposed me to the art world, and that exposed me yeah. to poets, and that exposed me to, to, to different writers. And so I was reading plays. I had an appetite for plays. I wanted to grow intellectually yeah. and spiritually and emotionally. And unfortunately for me, college didn't do that to me. College just kind of left me cold. It was, you know, I, I don't know. Maybe you just didn't find your people. Maybe. It just didn't work for me. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it looks like you, you created some kind of a university out of this environment, almost. Yeah. So I started spending as much time as I could in Manhattan. Yeah. Uh, you know, and... Um, was your mom a little bit relieved that you found something to do? Or was it so foreign to her? Did she say, oh gosh, now here he goes? Well, she really didn't know that much what I was doing. because I wasn't living with her at that time. Yeah. I, I had already moved out. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in America, people move out of had the house a lot quicker, yes. a lot sooner than they do in Europe. And I had already moved out. I was living in my own place. I was supporting myself by driving a taxi. Oh, nice. Which, talk about an acting class, that's... That is, you're listening to people's stories. Oh, oh my. Just riding the subways and driving a taxi in New York yeah. is all the acting school anyone would ever need. Um, so I was driving a taxi, I was supporting myself, and yeah, I created this artistic community, or I joined different artistic communities, and it saved me. It saved yeah. me from... It, it got me out of that... that close-minded, blue-collar world, and nothing, you know, blue-collar people are wonderful, but there's a kind of, um, you know, this is the way things are, and that's it. Yeah. And I got out of that world. Well, they're busy with now, because they okay. have to survive, yeah, right? Yeah, absolutely, Maybe. and I understand that fully. Yeah. But I just had a, a thirst for different things. Yeah. Um, and so. then you did theater. Yeah, so I did plays. I did several plays, off-Broadway plays. And I got uh, good reviews each mm -hmm. time, and, and I would start hearing the same thing, whether it was from the director 
or different actors in the cast or just people from the audience who would find me after the show, they would all say the same thing to me that my very first acting teacher said. They, they would all say, you know, you, you have this thing, you're interesting to watch. Mm -hmm. You're just interesting to watch. Wherever you go, I look at you. I don't, you know, I just want to see you. So I think you belong in front of a camera. And I didn't know. I, at that point, I was just happy being a theater actor. Yeah. I had no illusions of being a movie actor. I had no clue what that meant. I was happy in New York doing, mm -hmm. doing theater. It was fun. I enjoy it. But I heard this over and over and over. And um, uh, something came over me. And one day I packed up my Chevy. It was a Chevrolet. <laughs> and I drove across country. All the way here. Drove to California. Wow, it must be scary a little bit because you yeah. know some people at least in New York City. Yeah. Even if it is not the most marvelous career, at least you have some cushions, cushions around. I had a comfort zone there. Yes. So I drove to California and immediately, uh, as soon as I crossed the George Washington Bridge to start heading west, my comfort zone was gone. Yeah. <laughs> and I was, it was scary and exciting at the same time, mm -hmm. um, which is the best way you know you're scared and you're excited it's wonderful I had no idea what the future held and I'm glad I did it I'm glad I made that move so what happens you come here sometimes I talk to some of my friends especially uh, from Turkey they think there is a huge building called Hollywood there is. You go <laughs> <laughs> it's called the Scientology Center. Yeah, yeah. That's what it is. Yeah. But like they think that there is a building there. You knock the door, say, excuse me, I'm here to exactly. be a filmmaker yes. or an actor or something. And then they look at you, they talk to you, and they let you in or not. But Hollywood is just a word, actually. It's a concept. It's spread out. Right. And then you have to find the people. So you drive here to Los Angeles. Yeah. You park in front of Hollywood building. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. So it doesn't go like that. I know. I, yeah, How does of this course. go? I drove out here, and I, um, I wasn't very smart. I came out here. I didn't know anybody in mm -hmm. the business. I didn't have any connections. I had nothing waiting for me, except I knew one person, a Turkish guy. Okay. His name is Asaf. Asaf, Turkish connection. Turkish. I had a Turkish <laughs> connection, and this guy Asaf. What did he do? He at that time was a waiter. Awesome. But I knew Asaf from years ago, and he let me live with him and his wife. Mm -hmm. So he gave me a place to settle in and. Uh, I had to find a job, and I did. And my first job, I was working at a nightclub as a as a bouncer, I guess mm -hmm. in Turkey. What do they call it? Um, bouncer, maybe. You know, someone who stands at the door. Yes. If there's a fight, you break it up. Yes. If yes, there's yes. drunk people, you bodyguard. Give bodyguard, give me the show. Yeah. <laughs> so that was my first job in Los Angeles, and then I had to begin the process of trying to be an actor. So that's what I learned. That oh, you don't just go out there and they're all waiting for you. Here comes Alex Demir, a theater actor from New York. Nobody cares. Unless you're famous. Yes, but then, yeah. then you are not looking for anything anyways. They are looking for you. Then they're looking for you, yeah. yeah. That would have been nice. Yeah. That would have been very nice yeah. because the way I did it, um, it was extremely difficult. So what did you do? You auditioned? Yeah, what I got a do? job first and I started making money. So I could help Asaf and his wife and then eventually get my own place and live and pay bills and all that and just deal with, with the basics of life. And then I just started auditioning for mm -hmm. anything. And of course, I wasn't in any union yet. I wasn't yeah. in the actor's union. I didn't know anybody. So I started auditioning for anything. Student films, you know, non-union, non-paying things that some filmmaker is doing. Just anything, anything, anything, anything. Because in this town... Everyone has a, a headshot picture and a resume, but you know you have to ha get a, t a dem demo reel yes. that shows your work in front of the camera. And even that, now everybody has that. But, yes. but, but still, that's what you have to do. Also it's connections. I and you meet people. Yes. You meet filmmakers, you meet actors, you meet writers. You never know who's going to make it. You never know. Yeah. Um, so that's what I started doing. First you have to go to those auditions. First you have to get the audition. They have to pick you to come in and audition. Which is, that's a miracle in itself. Yes. Because you have to remember for each role, even if it's not paying anything, there's probably 
a few hundred, if not a thousand or more people yeah. Raising s- there. submitting their pictures or their agents are submitting their pictures for that role, for that one role. So you have to get the audition. And you have to be very thick-skinned. Oh, yeah, which, which is the biggest lesson of all for me. Yes. Um, so what was it like when, I'm sure you got rejected many times and you left everything for it. What does it feel like? Like, how do you not crawl and cry? Well, you do sometimes. Yes. <laughs> you do. But uh, How I, do you get over it then? How I got over it was realizing I really had no other choice. Mm-hmm. Or how do you manage to make it not feel like it's a personal rejection? Like they're not rejecting your talent or they do not not like you, but they just don't need you right now. Like how do you prepare yourself to that? Well, that's, that's, that's the spiritual lesson in all of this. Um, because we do tend to take things personally. Yes. And um, maybe that's ultimately the reason why I'm an actor is to, well, I know it is. It, it's why our, our paths choose us. It's about spiritual evolution. It's, it's about growing in those kinds of ways, not taking things personally, not um, needing approval or appreciation to keep going. To keep yeah. on going. It's yeah. about having inner strength. And that's a process I'm still going through and I'm still trying to deal with and come to terms with. And I, I'm, I know I'm better than I was 10 years ago. Yes. And I'm much better than I was 15 years ago. And hopefully I'll get better and better and better and better to where nothing, I take nothing personally. You know, I just, just all slides off my back. Yes. You know, I, that's, that's nirvana, perhaps. You know, yes. that's, that's enlightenment. Sometimes it feels like the people who um, made it are not the best people, but who could stand up and just let it go. Yeah. <laughs> like at the end, you're like shaking these like rocks and pieces and then they're all falling through and a couple of them managed to stay up. And then we know their names. Yeah. They're not necessarily the best. Right. Well, unless you are born into a... F- of family, course, like you're you just lucky, or if, if, yeah. ama- amazingly beautiful women, or something like right. they, they make it. But. If you have, if you start with nothing, like I did, then it's all about perseverance. You have yes. to just persevere. That is, if you have talent. If you don't have talent, you could persevere all you want. <laughs> you might get lucky once in a while. It but, happens sometimes. You're like, how did? How? Right, but the ones without talent. And without the right connections, they eventually, they go away. Yes. Um, but if you have talent, but you don't have any connections, you don't have family in the industry, or what, you have to persevere. And perseverance, yeah, it sounds wonderful. Yes, persevere, be strong. But you have to realize perseverance also means you have to come to terms with the fact that you might not live the kind of life that your friends back home are living. Yes. You right. know, you're not going to have financial security, perhaps, for a while, if ever. You are going to always feel a bit... <sighs> unsure of things. Unsure of the future, because you don't know when your next acting job is going to come up. It's so out of your hands, Yes, is what I'm trying to say. So, I don't know if that answers your question. But, it does, you know. because... Uh, sometimes people think that it's only about you memorize your lines right. and they find you. Yeah. But the, an actor has to deal with lots of other struggles. Sure. It, it's not only itself. Like you can't even focus on acting sometimes because you're so busy with other things, right? Absolutely. It's life. Life. Yeah. Life always comes into, the, into, the, into play and you have to deal with life. Um, Chokisha. <laughs> your, my cat. Your, your, my cat is sneezing. Your cat sneezed. She has a cold. <laughs> oh, well, well. Um, but listen, I don't want to make it sound like all doom and gloom. And, no, and, but it is, if you give a dose of reality to people, right, at right. least they, they think, do I really love it? 
enough exactly to just leave my country or leave my family or leave my comfort zone or leave my education and if i li love it that's okay you have to love it you have to know that there's nothing else there's nothing else for you otherwise do something else, live a normal life, be happy, have a nice house with children and get married and Yeah, that's a do good all, way that's too. wonderful. Yeah. yeah, that's wonderful. So So you came here and yeah. started auditioning. Yeah, I started auditioning. And what did you get first? Do you remember? Well, like I said, first you have to get the audition. Yes. <laughs> so what I was realizing is wow, I'm I'm not getting very many auditions. What's that all about? Then I understood, yeah, the reason is because for each role there's over a thousand people trying to get that audition, why are they going to pick you? Yeah. So, but then eventually, when I did get an audition, I had, I had talent, uh, just to be honest with you. So when I had an audition, most of the time I would get the job. Mm -hmm. if, unless it was something that completely, completely didn't fit me. Yes. But then I would think, well, why did they call me in for an audition? They saw my picture. But... Sometimes Still, I think they want to just keep that person on the side right. just to just know, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And even those experiences were valuable because I would go in and I would audition for a role that there was no way I would ever get it, but I would leave an impression in the filmmaker's yeah. mind. They'll remember And they you. remembered me three years later, four years later, seven years later, and I would do a film with them because yes. they remembered me from seven years ago. That happened uh, not too long ago. So I would audition, and then when I did get the parts, okay, we're talking about non-union, low, low, if any budget yeah. project. Maybe they'll give you a bagel or something. Maybe, yeah, a slice of pizza. <laughs> they'll feed you a little bit. I did many films for pizza. Yes. Um, but, okay, but what it all comes down to is you have to push all that stuff out of your mind and at some point it's just about the work. Mm -hmm. That's it. It's all about the work. So what's going to happen with this project, the budget, the food, I got to pay my electric bill, I got to pay my rent, I have to pay, my, I have to get car registration, this, my mother's saying, come back home, what are you doing over there, all my friends back in New York are getting married, they have children, and I'm worried about paying my phone bill, all this stuff has to leave your mind, but stay somewhere, because that's what feeds you as an artist also. Yes, of course. But eventually, it just has to come down to the work. And um, I've, I've, maybe because of my training in New York, maybe, who knows, some kind of genetic thing, I don't know, but I've been able to do that. So when I would do these little non-union, no-budget projects, my work stood out. And like I said, the director would remember me. And the next project they did, if there was more money, they put me in it. Yeah. And the next, they put me in it. And that's how I slowly, from, from the ground up, built a career. Yes. And now I'm at a point, yeah, it took a long, long, long time. But now I'm at a point where I'm actually, I'm making money from acting. Sometimes very good money. Sometimes very, very good money. And filmmakers call me mm -hmm. and ask me to do their project and... Um, yeah. So you're at that point. Yeah, I'm not a but star. I'm not famous. However, there's a small circle of people who know of me and yes. who know of my work. And you're able to work what you love and yeah. make money. I mean, yeah, I'm nobody doing, gets uh, to do that. Very few people get. To, <laughs> very few people get to do that. I'm doing what I love. I get paid for it. And more importantly, every once in a while, I get to tell. I get to tell a story that I think is important. Yes. Um, you, every once in a while. Are you writing? No, no, no. I, I, I tried. I don't have a talent for that. Okay. I'll be honest. Um, but I tried. It just like, you need to try everything. Yeah, of you know, course. I, I, tried, I, took, I tried ballet at one point. And I, <laughs> yeah, I can <laughs> see. I try anything, yeah. <laughs> but no, I, I'm an actor. I'm a vessel. I'm yes. a vessel for the writer. Okay. I'm an instrument. Yes. I can play any note you want. Um, Did you have you ever been in? I'm sure it happened to you because sometimes, like when I sing some pieces that are written by some modern composers, I love some of them. I despise some of them. I try to do my best uh, to make a value 
you know, to put, put a meaning into that. Is, did you like have scripts? You're like, oh, this is just awful. This is stupid. But you know what? I'll do it anyways. Oh, all of course, most of the time. <laughs> yes, right. Because I'm not yet, you know, I'm not John Travolta or Tom Cruise or any of these Nicolas Cage. I don't get to pick and choose. Now, if, if you're going to pay me, I'm, pro I'm probably going to do it. I'm prob unless it's just something terrible. But I've done some of those, too. <laughs> In uh, the beginning. Hopefully. Yeah, of course, of course. <laughs> uh, but uh, it's up to you. It's up to me as an actor to just be honest in the role and to try to lend some humanity, some honesty to the character that I'm playing and tell the story. And if it's a ridiculous story, well, I happen to be a part of that ridiculous story for this project. But every once in a while, you get lucky and a story finds you that's worth telling. Mm -hmm. For example, I have to mention this film I saw. I watched this film last night. It's called Even the Rain. Even? Even the Rain. Mm -hmm. The director, it's a, a Spanish woman. Oh, I wish I remembered her last name. It's, it's uh, Gael Garcia Bernal is starring mm -hmm. it, a wonderful Mexican actor. It's a fantastic film. It's about um, what's going on in Bolivia with the indigenous mm -hmm. people and how their water supply is being cut off to them and they're being, the government is trying to force them to pay for water. It's just, it's amazing. Oh, I think I know that. Movie. It's such an important mm -hmm. film. It's such a wonderful film. It's absolutely fantastic. And every once in a while a story like that gets told. Yes. Not, not usually by Hollywood, um, but there's always hope. And you hope that you will be a part of telling that story. Yes. But in the meantime, if you want to pay me to be a gangster who goes around killing people, I'll try to lend some humanity to that gangster. Yes. I'll bring my life and my experiences to that role. But ultimately, you know, I'm a gangster who kills people. <laughs> you yes. <know>? So. <laughs> but you, you are waiting for that great script and you need... To feed yourself until that script comes. Of course, of course. So you have to. And it's work. Work is always good because he, no matter what role you're playing, it gives you an opportunity to stretch as an artist, to create as an artist, to perhaps to collaborate with yes. different people. It's it, it's all good. Work is all. It's always, always, always good. How do you get yeah. ready for your work? Is it spontaneous, or do you study, or do you live like that for a week? Like, what do you do? It depends on the role. For example, years ago, I did a film where I played a, I played a chimney sweeper. So I actually went out, I, I did research, I rode along with a chimney sweeper, and I went to jobs with him, and I mm -hmm. saw how he did his job, and I talked to him, and we talked about the work, and, and I actually did it, and yeah, that, was, that was fun. I got to experience a side of life I otherwise, if I wasn't an actor, would never have experienced. Yeah. So there are times where you have to do research, at least I do. But there are other times where it just comes natural. And it's just about being honest in the moment, relating to the other actors around you, and, and trying to, if, he's a, if he or she is a director who has a vision, talking to her about her vision, and then, okay, I'm gonna help you to express your vision. I'm talking to the imaginary director. Yes, here. I can okay, see. Yes, okay. I'm going to. I'm going to help you express. She looks very talented. Yeah, she. I'm going to help <laughs> you express cute. your vision. <laughs> so that's. Yeah. Yeah, it depends. It totally depends on the role. Totally, totally depends on the role. Have you had? I'm sure you have had, but I'm asking anyways. Some scenes that were hard for you because you didn't believe in them. Hmm. Like you thought this char character wouldn't talk like this, or this wouldn't happen, or this is just not fitting. Yeah. And, and how do you deal with it? How I deal like with that, if I feel mm -hmm. that way, I speak with the director, mm -hmm. and we talk about it. And if I say the character wouldn't say this, at least not the way I know the character, yeah. wouldn't say this, we have a conversation, and maybe we can reach some kind of a compromise. Yeah. And, and usually that happens. I haven't met too many, at least I haven't met too many independent filmmakers mm -hmm. who are so rigid, no, the words have to be exactly. Yeah. I've worked luckily and gratefully with, with many, many people who are loose and they just want to be honest. Yeah. And they've said to me, listen, if you don't feel honest saying that, say this, because it, it makes the same point. Yeah. As long as you make the point. Um, TV 
I've done several yeah. TV shows. TV can be very, very. It has to be exactly what's on the page. It has to be. That's that's a little different, and it's more limiting. Mm -hmm. It's limiting in many ways. You know, you you have to stay in this little. You can't move. Yes. You know? Yeah, because they wrote probably like ten episodes ahead, so they can't yeah, really exactly. relax. So that's another challenge, but it's all it's all a good challenge. It's all a good challenge as an actor. So what are you working on now? Or right now, I I just finished this film. Yes. It's a independent short film called Here's Johnny. Here's Johnny. And Here's how, Johnny. How do we watch that? Uh, it's pretty soon they're gonna have a trailer up on YouTube. Okay. It's going to several different festivals. Awesome. Um, and who is it directed by? It's directed by a Turkish guy named Tekin Girgin. Tekin Girgin. Yeah, mm -hmm. and that's how they initially, you know, how we got connected because he's Turkish and I'm Turkish. But I still didn't know if I was interested. Yes. Because um, unless it's something I'm really interested in, the thought of doing another, you know, short film, it, it just sometimes it, it's. Time like, consuming it's time too. consuming, yeah. yeah. But I read the script. Okay. And the script is wonderful. I had a one I, I love the script. It's it's so entertaining. It's just entertaining. It's fun. And so I said, Okay, I'll do it. So I play the lead role. I'm Johnny. Mm hmm And of course, uh, I just had a lot of fun. I'm a gangster who's trying to be a comedian. <laughs> so I have these two sides. I have a side of me where I'm I live in this violent world and I I commit violence uh -huh. as my job, but I also want to be funny and make people laugh and tell jokes. So it was fun for me to do. It shows different parts of yeah. the acting. Of the, yeah. it's, it's very nice. What's coming up? Do you have... What's project? coming up right now? I have no idea. Something could come up this afternoon. Isn't I, that how it is? Yeah. It's, and that's part of, part of the joy of it. Yes. You don't know. That's also part of what makes it so scary, but that's also part of the joy. You never know what's going to happen next. I've gone from one day, I don't know uh, what I'm going to eat. <laughs> yes. I don't know. I have no money for dinner. And then two days later, I do an acting job, mm -hmm. and I've got tens of thousands of dollars coming. It, it's just, it's amazing. You, you don't know. Yes. You never know. And you have to just get used to this not yeah. knowing. Yeah, you have to just get in. You just have to dance the dance yes. and um, enjoy it. And be okay with not knowing. Be, yes. be okay with that. Well, it sounds like with your experience, uh, they want such polished people um, in front of them. It has no space for maybe a crossover person who has an accent, who, who is just um, for a Turkish person. I'm talking about like since our target audience are the Turks in America, if somebody is dreaming of this lunacy, <laughs> you know, because it's a crazy thing to do, yeah. but it's completely worth it, but it's crazy. Sure. Uh, for a Turkish actor, even the tiniest bit of an accent will not be accepted, I'm guessing. In thousands of people, they don't need that. Well, but there are roles for people who have accents. Yes. Yeah, they're less. But it will be of course. A smaller, yeah. It's already a really, really, really difficult business. Yes. Now, if you have an accent, that makes the roles even less, even yes. more, minimizes them even more. So. And it's not a minority that has a presence. Exactly. I mean, if you had a like a Spanish accent, you could do it. Sure. Because it, there is a presence. That's very that. marketable. Yes. That's very marketable. Yes, yeah. but uh, this kind of rare nationalities in Hollywood. It's right. tough. Listen, I've, I've been in Los Angeles, I think about 16 years now. Mm -hmm. I have experienced in 16 years, maybe three times where they were looking for someone who was Turkish, who, you know, speaks a little Turkish, has a Turkish accent. Three times in 16 years. So that's not a career. If you're going to come out here and you speak Turkish, but you speak English with a Turkish accent and your English isn't very good, you're not going to have a career yes. because there are no roles written for Turks because we're such a tiny, tiny, tiny minority here. Yes. So for me, I, you know, I, I don't have a Turkish accent. I was born and raised in New York. I speak like a New Yorker. Yes. 
Uh, so it's a different thing. But what about, for example, let's speak, talk about um, directors. Yeah. Or camera people. Do they have a light at the end of this whole Absolutely. Time? Oh, yeah. So acting is much harder. Acting, Unless yeah. you're, uh, you were born in America, you speak like you, and you have talent and stamina, right. and you try it, that's okay. But you don't come from Turkey, like my kind of Turkish, and try to make it. It's ridiculous. You can try, and you might get lucky. Yeah, but it is, there are millions of people trying of to be actors. Every year, yes. there's millions more. Yes. Yeah, of course. Who speak perfect. I know. I so know. So it's it's not gonna happen. The probably. odds are very very against yes. it happening. Yes. Absolutely. But for directors, camera oh, people. Oh, then it doesn't matter if you have an accent. Yes. Yeah. So do you know lots of Turks here, or? I know a few, not not a lot, uh, but I know Turks who are actually working in the industry, still you know up and coming, but as directors, um, uh, editors. Uh, composers who compose music for films so of, it, accent doesn't matter yes of course it doesn't matter there and even being uh, from a different culture might make you more it valuable. might even, exactly might make you more valuable because you have a different perspective yes you have a different that's perspective true. yeah so you you have you directed anything no, ever absolutely not no interest uh, I just know that I've that's not for me. I'm an actor. Again. You wanna be in front of the camera. No, no, it's not about that. I'm <laughs> okay. I'm an instrument. Okay. Play me. That's it. I can't play anybody else. Mm -hmm. But play me. I'm I'll play whatever notes you want and I'll make it honest. I'll make it truthful. But as a director, I just know I couldn't handle that. It's it's such a such a huge job. Yes. As an actor, you focus on your role. You focus on your job. You focus on being truthful and being bringing integrity to your work. But as a director, you've, you're, you're responsible for everything. There's no way I could do that. I'd be kidding myself if I thought I could. Yeah. I know my capabilities. I know my capabilities. I know my limitations. Mm -hmm. um, it's already too much to handle anyways, right? <laughs> this career is some, some monster career to begin with, right? To tackle. Well, and also, and it's interesting because as we know, many, many, many actors, when you talk to them, they're, they really, I want to direct one day. Yes. They all want to yes. direct. They want, I don't. I don't want to direct. I like being an actor. I just want interesting roles and, and, and projects that I feel are important. And then the ones that aren't that important, I'll make it work. Yes. I'll do my, I'll do my part. What's your most proud movie? Or, or television, doesn't matter. It doesn't even have to be a big role. Um, there, have been a, there, there have been a few. But I have to mention, well, this latest one, just because it was so much fun. Mm -hmm. I had so much fun doing it. I was so grateful doing it. And every day, I, uh, I would just sit somewhere and think to myself, wow, I'm having such a great time. I'm, I'm doing a role I, I'm, I'm enjoying so much. I'm collaborating with people. We're having fun. So that's why this latest role in Here's Johnny was just a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful time. And that's so important because you need those to keep on going. But as far as uh, important, important mm -hmm. projects, see, I have to think long and hard about that. Uh, I, I have to mention a short film I did several years ago where I, I, I talked to you. I, I played a chimney sweeper. Yes. It's called Well Sooted. Yeah, I saw that. It's and, awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, and listen, it's not, it's not a film or a story that's going to save the world or, or anything, but the way the filmmaker, uh, his name is Artur Tufekciolo, the way mm -hmm. he told the story, he brings you into this world and you just suspend what you think the world or reality is for a while, and you're in this world of chimney sweepers. It, it's just... I was blown away. See, and that's why when I look at someone like him, a filmmaker like him, I was blown away by what he did with that script. It, it, it takes such a talent. So 
That I I yeah. mentioned that role. Well suited. Yeah. Well it's, suited. It's, yeah. It's, it's a great movie. I saw that. Yeah. Do you are you considering a career in Turkey ever or not? If a role comes up and um, I mean people have spoken to me. Would from you Turkey. do a fully Turkish language film? As long as it was okay that my character had an accent, and he spoke in broken Turkish. But you, you could probably just memorize the lines, and I mean you're an actor. You evet, tam aksanım var tabi. Amerikan, Türkçe konuşursam aksanım var. Hemen anlıyorsun. Bu adam Türkiye'de doğmadı, Türkiye'de büyümedi, Türkiye'de okula gitmedi. Ama yine de still there could be some project. Olabilir, tabi olabilir, olabilir. What would you like to tell me? I mean, I talked about some things that I thought you would be interested talking about, but tell me what you want to talk about. Because we are promoting you after all. Okay. What I would like to talk about? What um, did we miss? Documentaries. My favorite films are documentaries. Okay. By the way. And I just saw one recently called Mines in the Mines in the Water or Mines in the Oceans about the dolphins and what human beings are doing to the oceans mm -hmm. and particularly how it's affecting the, the dolphins. And I think it's very important for everyone to watch. And another one is Peaceable Kingdom about the mm -hmm. factory farming industry. And I'm a huge animal rights activist. Yeah. That's my passion, you know, mm -hmm. other, other than acting. Um, I care a lot about uh, the rights of animals and mm -hmm. uh, animal abuse. And I don't want to get all preachy and tell people you can't eat meat and all that stuff. No, but it, it, I just wish we could um, cause as little harm as possible. Mm -hmm. And I think if more people really saw what happens in um, the factory farms and slaughterhouses yeah. and sees how these animals are treated, I think you need a lot less meat. Yeah. You need a lot less meat. And that's not just good for the planet and not just good for animals, but it's good for us as human beings as well. And that's it. That's that's what I care about. Yes. That's, yeah. that's the kind of awesome. Yeah. So. Hayvanlar. <gülüyor> Hayvanlar. Hayvanlar. Hayvanları severim. Hayvanları çok severim. Evet. Çok se Benim üç tane kedim var. Hmm. Cengiz, Nick and Maya. Cengiz mi? Cengiz evet. Onu nereden buldun o ismi? Ah. Cengiz'e benziyor. <gülüyor> <gülüyor> Tipinde Cengizlik var. He looks like a Cengiz. <gülüyor> Koskocaman kedi. Ne renk? Uh, like... Uh, Blonde. Karışık Kind of sarışın. Ha, yeah. sarman gibi. Evet. Yeah. E, yeah. Cengiz tipi var. Ceng ama büyük kafası var. Big, big hands, you know. Mm -hmm. Şey gibi, he's like a küçük aslan gibi. <gülüyor> <gülüyor> Çok şeker. Cengiz, evet. Yeah. Öbürü neydi? Maya mı? Maya. Bir de? Nick. Nick. Nick. Nicholas. Nick. Ha. Yeah, so. O da şişman mı? <gülüyor> Hepsi şişman. Çünkü durmadan <gülüyor> yemek veriyorum. Bizim kefer gibi. Evet. Durma. Yemek istiyorlar. Tabii, okey. Karnını açma. Okey, tamam. <gülüyor> evet. Çok anyway, so that's it. Yeah, so I'm, I'm passionate about animal rights. I just, I feel like, um, you know, listen, they're, they're sentient beings. Mm -hmm. We all know they love to give and receive love. And how can you abuse or mistreat? Yeah. It's just, it's beyond me. So, that's all. It's your soft spot. Yeah, I mean, amongst other things, uh, but that's that's something I'm extremely Important. passionate about. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So we are at the end of Mutish Türkler, ve dostları. We had Alex Demir, our actor friend, today, and um, please uh, watch and follow us on atnc.tv. Bye. Mm -hmm.